Welcome to all of you joining us, whether you are joining us here live or viewing this as a recording at a later date, we're so happy to have you with us. My name is Naomi Hoffer and I'm the program manager for the UCSF Sherry Sobrato Brisson Brain Cancer Survivorship Program. And also here in the background and part of the survivorship team is Alexa Greenstein, who is our survivorship nurse practitioner, and Mary Destry, who is our Marin Expansion Program Liaison. This webinar is part of our monthly Living Well After Brain Cancer Treatment webinar series, which is a segment of our growing survivorship program that we have launched at the UCSF Neuro-Oncology Department, thanks to a generous donation from Sherry Sobrato Grissom. Other components of our program include a neurocognitive consultation clinic, integrative therapies classes, a peer support program and thrivers community, and an exercise counseling service. I'm so glad to be with you to learn together what it means to be a young adult living with brain cancer and what ideas and resources are out there specifically to support this population. Many of you who are listening are intimately familiar with this topic, and I hope today you find some additional strategies that you might not have thought of, and at the very least know that you are not alone. So first, we will hear from our featured medical experts on the prevalence and characteristics of brain tumors in the young adult population and the potential medical concerns, challenges, and impact of these on one's life, as well as some recommended strategies that can help one thrive. We'll then have the good fortune of hearing directly from two wonderful young thrivers who will offer a more personal perspective on their experience of living with this disease and what has been helpful for them. And we invite you to submit your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll then continue a discussion face-to-face -face in our unrecorded after the show segment. We hope that you're able to stay and turn on your videos so that we can have a dialogue together and perhaps hear from you what your best practices are in regards to thriving as a young adult with brain cancer. So it is now my absolute pleasure to introduce our first featured speaker for today's webinar. Dr. Jessica Schulte is a neuro-oncologist at UCSF who specializes in the treatment of adolescent and adult glioma and neurofibromatosis. She has a specific interest and focus in optimizing the transition between pediatric and adult medical care, which involves expanding on opportunities for clinical trial involvement, matching patients to trials that are most appropriate for them, as adolescents may be eligible for both adult and pediatric clinical trials. Other areas she is passionate about include improving supportive care services for adolescent and young adult brain tumor population. Dr. Shelty, I am thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for being with us today. And I will now turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to share my screen. Do the slides come out all right? Yeah, that looks great. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. All right, so as Naomi said, my name is Jessica Schulte, and I am a pediatric and adult neuro-oncologist here at UCSF. And today I'll be talking about um, thriving as a young adult with brain cancer. So just as a bit of background, I wanted to define this group of patients that is called AYA, which stands for Adolescent and Young Adults. And this refers to a special group of, of patients um, in cancer defined as a vulnerable population by the National Cancer Institute, because these patients lie at the intersection of pediatric and adult care. There are sort of two overlapping groups that comprise this AYA population. So one, if you receive a diagnosis of cancer between the ages of 15 to 39, these cutoffs are, are a little bit arbitrary, but it's identifying important developmental periods of one's life where you're transitioning between being an adolescent to young adult to an older adult. Um, so there are of course some patients with overlapping needs that are a little bit younger than 15 and a little bit older than 39. And then the second group of patients are um, patients that were actually diagnosed and treated as a child and they have currently aged out of that pediatric period and are now in ages 15 to 39. So the needs are similar between these two populations, although not identical. Um, and this population collectively of AYA neuro-oncology patients is actually quite large. So in 2020, about 80,000 new central nervous system tumors, so that's brain and spinal cord, were diagnosed in the U.S. And of those 80,000, 11,000 were in this age group. 
So it is a huge population and we have to be better attuned to the needs of this population. I think of cancer patients um, as having sort of two different modes. And um, the first mode is when you're first diagnosed, you're trying to figure out what the tumor is, trying to figure out what the next steps for treatment are, you're making decisions about treatments, whether or not you'll do a clinical trial, what do I need to preserve my fertility and function and um, cognitive function over time? How do I make it to appointments? How do I do all this while having a life um, outside of the after treatment? And then there's this other aspect of survivorship, and that can involve a lot of different elements. I've listed some of those here and we'll go into them in more detail in the talk. I do wanna emphasize that although these are two different modes, they're not dichotomous. So they can exist within each other. And there are different moments where you might experience different aspects in each of them at the same time. And I think that's particularly true of brain tumor patients because you have ongoing surveillance needs throughout your life. Just talking about the biology of tumors, there is a little bit of difference in the pathology that we see in younger patients, adolescents and young adults compared to all ages with brain tumors. So this is the distribution from the central brain tumor reporting mechanism, C. C butrus. And um, you can see the breakdown of pathology between all ages on the left and AYA patients on the right. You'll see that some of the pathologies are the same, but in different frequencies. So for example, glioblastoma, which is the most frequent malignant brain tumor in adults, is still present in the AYA group at a slightly reduced percentage. In addition, there are other differences um, in vinyl tumors, which tend to be a little bit more aggressive, such as germ cell tumors or medulloblastomas, and then more well-behaving tumors like pilocytic astrocytomas and neuroepithelial tumors. So there are some differences in the tumors that can affect these different age groups. It is important to note that there are many different molecular differences between brain tumors. So not only between the different names of tumors, so oligodendroglioma, meningioma, glioblastoma, but even within the same tumor type, you can have drastically different subgroups of molecular features. And we see that these tend to cluster around different age groups. So here's a paper that looked only at the molecular features in glioblastoma. And there's a lot of jargon here, but essentially there are six big subgroups of molecular features. And you can see that over time with age, these, these vary, the frequency varies by age. So for example, this K27 type, this G34 type, a little bit more common in younger populations, including the AYA patients, whereas in older patients where we see more GBMs, it's a different genetic phenotype with the EGFR um, alterations. So that has a lot of important implications for how we treat these tumors from the start, what the prognosis is like, how a patient might respond to different treatments, so it is important to keep in mind that, you know, a name is just a name and we have to take all of these other factors into account. There are a lot of important access issues that affect the AYA population. So just like other brain tumor patients, you're thinking about how you can get the best subspecialty care. And that often means having someone that has experience with brain tumors, the surgeon, the chemo doctor, the oncologist, that's who I am, the radiation oncologist, pathologist, radiologist. Often these can be really hard subspecialists to find in many hospitals, but it's always important to note that you can um, ask your doctor to reach out to other institutions, ask for help and guidance. And, you know, at least here, we're always healthy, happy to weigh in. And I know many other neuro-oncologists are as well. But in addition to that, the AYA sort of folk, um, faces this unique um, situation where they could be assigned to either a pediatric or adult provider. Um, you know, this is certainly the case with an 18-year-old that they could be happened to, 
to be referred to either of those, the pediatric or adult providers. But even some 30 some year olds that are diagnosed with a more pediatric tumor, meaning we see it more often in kids, can land on either side. It's important to, to note that there are treatment differences that can sometimes exist on either side. Some of that is based in literature um, that is and studies that have been done on each population. And some of that is a little bit of art and finesse and experience. So um, just to know that sometimes there can be a different approach. And then for clinical trial options, there's actually um, more opportunities in some ways for AYA patients because sometimes you can qualify for trials on either side. So for example, um, the pediatric neuro-oncology trials that we offer here at UCSF and at other institutions often will allow patients to be included up to age 39. So another thing to think about with your doctor. Just to switch gears a little bit, I want to focus more of this talk on the survivorship aspects of being a young adult with brain cancer. So certainly you have ongoing medical concerns and that's that bleed from the active treatment. You're still getting regular scans, you might have side effects. A lot of patients describe this phenomenon of skin anxiety. Um, I don't know if anyone here can identify with that. You know you have a scan coming up and you feel really anxious of what it might show. And I think that's even more prevalent with the brain tumor population because we know that many brain tumors can grow back again and it's very important to keep up with the MRI surveillance. In addition to that, you might have symptoms such as fatigue, headaches, seizures, physical disability, including weakness and inability to walk, speech issues, you might have other problems with different organs, including your bone marrow affecting your blood counts. Some patients have disfigurement from their surgeries or radiation. You might have hormone dysregulation. And for those patients in particular that have received radiation, you're at a higher risk of stroke and secondary tumors. In particular, the brain tumor population is really impacted in the domain of neurocognitive effects. So um, many brain tumor patients um, receive intracranial radiation, meaning radiation to their head, and they receive it at higher doses than other cancers. This is a study looking at survivors of childhood cancer. So just focusing on that one population for a moment. And what we know is that the younger kids receive radiation, the higher risk they have for for more profound impacts in cognition. So this is a graph looking at um, radiation over time, the impact from radiation over time, so time since the radiation on the x-axis, and then IQ scores on the y-axis. And we know the younger patients are when they receive radiation, the more at risk they are for more severe neurocognitive impacts over time. But it's not just kids that are impacted by radiation. So at first, an adult with a brain tumor might notice focal deficits relating to where the particular tumor is in the brain. So um, if you have a tumor, in, for example, in your temporal lobe, you might have speech deficits um, related to the tumor in the surgery. If it's in the frontal lobe, you might feel a little bit more disinhibited, um, that sort of thing. But over time, as you have exposure to chemotherapy and radiation, you might develop more diffuse issues of net networking and connectivity within your brain. And these are more subtle things that many patients complain of um, and impact their daily life, but are kind of hard to articulate. So concentration is a big one. Um, cognitive stamina, so being able to get through an intellectually challenging task without having to take breaks is very challenging for brain tumor patients. Memory issues, multitasking, word finding, these are all subtle things that make an impact with daily life and can sometimes be one of those silent signs of disease. So you look great on the outside, but you're really impacted by these neurocognitive symptoms. These neurocognitive symptoms and the physical symptoms can really impact your ability to carve out your life. And the AYA period, even for patients, even for people without cancer is an incredibly important time for development and for life milestones 
you're trying to figure out who you are, what you want to do, um, who you want to be around. And you're navigating all of that in the context of having a cancer diagnosis. You might have new goals that um, have come out of the woodwork since you're not on active treatment anymore. That might mean living independently, moving out of your family's house, driving again, going to school, work, dating, having a family. And again, it's figuring out how to navigate those things with disabilities and symptoms. We do know, unfortunately, that AYA patients, especially brain tumor patients, are at a disadvantage for becoming independent. Um, so we know that AYA brain tumor survivors are less likely than their siblings to report that they're currently employed, that they have a larger income, and that they've graduated from college. And some of that relates to the neurocognitive impact that they have, but even the practical things, making it to frequent doctor's appointments can often interrupt school and work, and dealing with the fatigue issues can be really impactful. There's also some issues of establishing your autonomy and your independence as a person. So often when you're going through a cancer treatment and diagnosis as a young adult, you have a lot of support from your family and friends, maybe even a spouse is involved and you have shared decision-making. At some point, you're trying to transition to um, a focus where you're making more of the decisions. Um, and then it's trying to figure out how to balance getting input from your loved ones, but also not developing that codependency where you have to do everything together and decide everything together. Um, another um, side of two sides of the flipped coin is setting boundaries with your family and friends saying, I don't want you to come to this appointment anymore. I just want to talk to the doctor on my own or um, you know, I don't want to share how I'm feeling today. It's pretty crappy. Just leave me alone. But, you know, sometimes that's hard to balance with not isolating yourself from your friends and family. And then again, doing all of this while trying to go through all those really important life transitions as an AYA person. It's a real push and pull sometimes. During this time, you're also trying to flesh out personal relationships, um, both friendly and romantic. And we know that young patients with central nervous system tumors, so brain and spinal cord, were less likely than siblings or even other types of cancers, cancer patients, to have many friends, have regular social interactions, and get married. So these are all challenges that are being faced. And a lot of it relates to the isolation that you can feel as someone going through a cancer treatment program. However, I do wanna say that there, there is some hopeful evidence out there that it doesn't have to limit everything in your life. So there was this really neat study that I came across that was looking at, um, it, it modeled a simulated um, dating experiment, experiments where they said to a group of people, here's two profiles, one is a patient with cancer, a person who had cancer, and another one is a person who um, has a friend with cancer. And there was no difference in the interests between those patients. And that's what this all shows here. There were a couple of exceptions. So if the person looking at the profile was widowed, they were a little bit less interested in dating someone with cancer. And if the patient, um, the person's profile said that they were undergoing active treatment. They were a little less interested, but otherwise no differences. And I think that's really important to remember. Patients who have gone through brain cancer treatments have issues with sexual health and reproduction as well. And this is a really important time for sexual health. And it's kind of pushed to the wayside as you're going through treatment. A lot of survivors have symptoms that can decrease their sexual satisfaction, low desire, genital pain, sometimes decreased lubrication, erection difficulties. That can relate to some of the hormonal dysfunction that we see after treatment, which is especially true in brain tumor patients. And can compared to um, a group of people who are the same age but didn't have brain cancer, AYA cancer survivors describe decreased satisfaction with their sexual function. In addition to sexual function and sexual interest, there can be challenges for planning to have a family as well. So brain tumor patients in particular have risk to fertility 
if you've received radiation. So there's a lot of studies looking at children who've received radiation, and this is kind of a middle dose, the 22 gray, but it can have impact to that hypo hypothalamic pituitary axis, which eventually regulates your sexual function um, in your ovaries and testicles. And then chemotherapy can also impact fertility as well. There are some studies showing that temozolomide, which is the most common chemotherapy that we use in the adult neuro-oncology clinic, might impair sperm production and egg viability. In addition to the physical impacts on fertility, there's a lack of education among medical providers and to patients about the risk of fertility with brain cancer treatment. So um, they did a large study at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is one of the larger brain cancer institutes. And they showed that only 10% of patients were getting information about fertility um, when they were receiving active treatment. But the study also showed that patients were able to go on to get pregnant after treatment. So that's important to keep in mind. But I think this is really um, unique um, or over amplified in our younger patients because you are not a, a 60 or 70 or 80 year old one, um, woman or man that's out of the range of childbearing age. This is the time of your life where you're actively thinking about planning a family. And in addition to dealing with the stress of having a cancer diagnosis, you're also trying to figure out how to make this work. So it's an important thing to consider. So we mentioned a lot of these points and um, many of them can be impacted by um, the the treatment that you receive and the effects of the treatment that you receive, um, it's a lot to juggle. So even if you are doing any of these things well, you're doing more than the, the average AYA person. And you know, in addition to making a life, raising a family, finishing school, you're trying to keep all these medical appointments, not trying not to feel anxious about your next scan, and then also trying to find other people that you can identify and have honest conversations with. So with all of those stressors, it's not surprising that there are a lot of mental health issues as well. This is looking at brain cancer survivors in particular, and it's using a scale called the Brief Symptom Inventory, which looks at a variety of, ment of mental health symptoms. Um, here, the GSI is a global summary of that scale, and we know that there are more mental health symptoms in brain cancer survivors compared to their siblings. Um, the P, P value of 0 0.001 means that it's statistically significant, um, also significantly more depression as well as somatic distress, which means that you're having physical manifestations of the emotional distress that you go through with this incredibly stressful process of having brain cancer. Um, interestingly, this particular study did not notice um, note a difference in anxiety that was statistically significant, but there are many other studies that have showed that brain cancer survivors have a high rate of anxiety compared to um, age controls. Another thing that can really impact AYA brain cancer patients is that um, 20 to 30 percent of them describe post-traumatic symptoms. So that means that they have anxiety and thinking about the prior medical treatments that they've had, such as surgery, radiation, going to the doctor, getting an IV, having MRIs, and that that flavors their experience going forward. Often, um, and you know, 20 to 30 percent of these patients, the symptoms are so severe that they qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD. So these can be really impactful, and it's often not discussed with the brain cancer population. So obviously, there are a lot of challenges um, when you are a person with a brain cancer diagnosis, but it's important to think about how we can channel that into you being. Um, the most successful version of yourself and how you can achieve the goals that you would like to achieve. So I just like to keep these things in mind and talk about them with my patients um, once they're more in that survivorship phase of their life. So first of all, just celebrate your accomplishments. You've done amazing things, going through treatment, keeping up with the appointments, 
figuring out brain tumor biology, um, learning how to talk to doctors who say a lot of medical jargon, dealing with your parents when you don't want to deal with them or your spouse when they nag you that um, you should call the doctor for that. It's a lot. So celebrate that you um, did all that and give yourself a pat on the back to take charge of your life. So you are an adult and you've had a lot of support through this process, but it's time to take ownership of your health and do as much as you can. That's always a balance, of course. You should always ask for support from your physician, from your family and friends when you need it, but it can say, I would like to make this a priority. You know, my symptoms are a priority. My mental health is a priority. Learning what a brain tumor does is a priority. Um, make sure you know those priorities and then make sure you address them with the support of your family and friends. Keep in mind long-term care. So this is a long-term illness. Unlike many other kinds of cancer, this is something that you will continue to have in your life so thinking about what surveillance needs you need, you have, what MRIs, what lab work, but also the long-term side effects that you might have. Access any resources you can, and I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. Um, honesty is really important. So being honest with yourself and your family, both what your needs are, but also what your limitations are. And that will be much more helpful in setting up realistic expectations for what you can accomplish on a day-to-day -day or even yearly basis. And then find someone you can trust, someone that you can talk to when you're having an awesome day or when you're having a really bad day. That can either be your best friend from when you were five or your spouse or family member or a medical professional. I recommend all of my patients get a therapist, it can be really helpful to have that objective perspective and someone that you can just unload without feeling um, any guilt about. What questions should you ask your doctor? So when you're in this survivorship mode, you want to focus your energy more on how you can make sure that you're taking care of your tumor, but also um, focusing more on the other aspects of your life. So one thing to ask is if there is a survivorship clinic that focuses on these needs. Um, we have one here for childhood survivors. Um, many institutions do, um, but even outside of that, and we have our support groups performing for survivors here at UCSF. Even if you don't have access to that, you can ask for a one-time meeting with your physician to, to talk about everything not related to is the tumor growing or not on your MRI long-term side effects, what symptoms are you having right now? How often do I actually have to come in for these MRIs and labs? And then what mental health needs do you have? And then another thing to consider um, talking about with your, your um, physician, sorry, I got distracted by a chat, um, is that uh, if the tumor comes back, what options do you have available for treatment? So think outside of the box. That doesn't mean you need to go down a rabbit hole of looking up every single clinical trial online, but you can say, hey, I heard that, you know, I might have clinical trial options available on the pediatric side or the adult side, or should I be looking at other institutions? Those are all possibilities, um, especially since uh, there are unique tumors that could affect you during this AYA period. So here's some resources. Um, one, you can rely on your doctor's office. So often there's a social worker or care manager that can help you navigate some of the practical aspects of things. So applying for disability, applying for accommodations at school or work, um, how to navigate insurance issues. Um, there might be in-person or on Zoom support groups. So we have a lot of those resources here at UCSF, both for patients and caregivers. And then as Naomi mentioned, we have now a, a peer support system with one-to-one -one support um, through telephone or text. You can also ask your doctor to refer to other professionals. So 
your doctor you might not have the answer your doctor might not have the answer but hopefully if they're a caring and thoughtful doctor they'll be able to rely on the expertise of their colleagues so that could be sending you to a hormone doctor or a fertility doctor or referring you for things like physical therapy or psychotherapy which could be crucial to um, decrease some of your disability and then there's a lot of online resources. I don't really have to tell this group that. I've learned from all of you where to look. Um, the ones that are listed here are focused more towards the AYA population. In particular, Stupid Cancer has really great information about what it means to have a brain tumor, what it means to be a survivor, what's treatment like. Um, the rest of these, Critical Mass, Ullman Foundation, Live Strong, Elephant's Tea, those are all AYA geared. Um, the Children's Oncology Group has um, specific focus towards AYA survivorship now, which is great. Um, so this is sort of a guidebook, um, similar to a checklist or what things you should be thinking about as a survivor. And then I found that patients find a lot of support in less formal mechanisms. So Twitter, Facebook, and um, Discord, which is like an online community platform, uh, you can just search for brain tumor, brain tumor so social media, um, AYA social media is a new one I just found. So those can all be great places um, to find support um, because this can be quite isolating when, um, especially as a young person, you know, your friends and family don't really have the same challenges medically that you do. And then I listed a couple of resources for fertility preservation in particular. So we have a Center for Reproductive Health at UCSF, but there's also this great information website, Onco Fertility Consortium, which is run out of Northwestern and Michigan State, which gives you more information about that. So in summary, um, the AYA neuro-oncology patients are a vulnerable population that are really at the intersection of pediatric and adult care, but can benefit from services on both sides. The tumors that affect this population often have gen different genetic and epigenetic features, so lots of different um, molecular features that are different in this age group versus younger and older patients. Um, AYA brain tumor patients have ongoing needs throughout their life. This is still a chronic illness, but they have the unique challenge of having all of those um, medical effects while navigating really important milestones in their life. And there are a lot of in-person and online resources to help navigate that transition. And I think that's, that's all for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Schulte. That was really clear um, and useful, important information. And I am so grateful that there are people like you that are that care so much about this topic and this population. Thank you for all that you do. Um, I wanna remind those of you listening, if you have questions, please submit it in the Q&A and we'll bring um, Dr. Schulte back again to answer your, your questions in our Q&A segments. Um, but now it's my extreme pleasure and honor to introduce two Thriver panelists who are joining us to offer a more personal perspective on this topic. Two weeks into starting as social media director for then presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren, Anastasia Golovashkina was diagnosed with a billiard ball sized glioblastoma at the age of 25. She continued to work full-time through a full course of treatment and doubled down on her commitment to politics and activism. Before serving as Elizabeth Warren's social media director, Anastasia launched and led the social media department at Trilogy Interactive, to which she has now returned as a senior director, developing and directing innovative digital strategies for progressive campaigns and organizations. Her work recruiting millions of supporters, multiplying content engagements, and raising millions of dollars through channels has won her a Silver Holly Award for Best Use of Social Media, as well as a Woman in Content Marketing Award. I'm so happy to have Anastasia here. And Jeremy Pivor is a Senior Program Coordinator for the Planetary Health Alliance based at Harvard School of Public Health, where he coordinates a global consortium of 250 organizations from over 50 countries, focusing on the human health impacts of global environmental change. For over a decade, Jeremy has worked in environmental conservation, international climate change policy, and public health. 
his conservation efforts have taken him around the world. Originally diagnosed with brain cancer at the age of 12, Jeremy had a recurrence when he was 23 and nine months into medical school. Jeremy pursued and obtained his master's degree in health and medical science from the UC Berkeley UCSF joint medical program. And as a brain cancer survivor, when Jeremy is not focusing on environmental and public health, he passionately advocates for the brain tumor and young adult cancer communities through writing, public speaking, fundraising, and lobbying with organizations like the National Brain Tumor Society and Dana-Farber. He serves as a patient ambassador on palliative care for the Endwell Foundation and co-moderates a monthly brain tumor social media Twitter chat. His writing has been featured in the Washington Post, Cure Magazine, and several other publications. Anastasia and Jeremy, I am truly honored to have both of you here with us today to help us understand this more from a personal perspective. Um, so to start, I'd love to hear from both of you um, about a little bit about your diagnosis and um, your life leading up to your diagnosis and starting with maybe some of the biggest challenges that you faced after diagnosis. Uh, so um, Anastasia, I'm going to turn it over to you if we can start with you. Sure, <clears throat> totally. So I've been extremely passionate. Amy, you've heard about uh, this in my bio. I'm extremely passionate about politics. Basically, since I think 2008, when Barack Obama ran for president, I ran students for Barack Obama at the University of Chicago campus. I entered with 270, working like on Cory Booker's first Senate run, working for Ro Khanna's first run in the House over there in the Bay Area. Um, and I joined Trilogy Interactive right after graduating college uh, in the Bay Area, again, working with clients like Dean Phillips, Chuck Schumer, Jay Inslee, um, ballot propositions like yes on 64, yes on 55, one and two, yada, yada, yada. Um, and the night that Elizabeth Warren announced she was running for president, uh, I think it was uh, New Year's Eve on 2018, I was thrilled and literally went home after that the party and applied the night she announced she was uh, doing a launch an exploratory committee to run for president. And I was, I was so thrilled. Um, I went through the interview process. I was accepted to join, um, had a whole goodbye party with my team, and then uh, started remotely from California working for the campaign in Boston. And two weeks in, I just, symptoms started multiplying so quickly, I felt nauseous. I dropped ice cream and it took me an hour to clean up and I was confused about what was going on. Typing suddenly became difficult. Um, I was getting forgetful and, uh, but I just blamed myself for all these things. I was thinking, well, I'm on the West coast working East coast hours. Oh, my keyboard is broken. And just four days into it, I felt like glass was exploding in my head. And I think waking up with that symptom was when I realized I can't live like this. I went to urgent care. And I think a big reason I also put it off was just, I didn't know how much things would cost. I was terrified. Um, urgent care suspected I was having a stroke. My balance was, it, it was non-existent. Um, and, uh, the good news was I, I wasn't having a stroke. The bad news was, was I had a tumor about the size of a billiard ball. And I just, I still remember my first question to the doctor was, can I survive this? And, and my second question was, does insurance cover it? It's, it's terrifying to go through this process um, and our healthcare system, even with incredible facilities like UCSF is, does not, it, it, I mean, it's a for-profit system that's designed to maximize profits, not designed to maximize quality or length of life. And I think my res the results and my experience with that uh, speaks for itself. But in any case, uh, if anything, um, it's, ter it's a terrifying diagnosis to receive, of course, and Googling it can be pretty scary, but more than anything, it's really doubled down my, my passion and commitment for activism and for finding other folks who are experiencing this and for finding solutions. Um, it will be about uh, exactly over, uh, exactly two years and a little over a month uh, that I, since I've been diagnosed and I never lose sight of how extremely, extremely lucky I am to be alive, to be able to talk to you, to be here and to experience everything. Um, as you mentioned, I continued working full time through a full course of treatment, but it's also, I wouldn't wish this challenge on anyone, I, uh, even my non-existent worst enemies, but I do know that it's made me a better person. And I think it's definitely made me realize how grateful I am, even for those small annoyances in life. Like it just, life is so beautiful and experiencing it is, such a privilege. 
Thank you so much, Anastasia. That's so that's so heartwarming to hear. And I know that so many people out there can relate to, to some of what you're saying. Um, and Jeremy, I would love to hear from you about your experience and leading up to your diagnosis. I know you experienced it at a younger age. I did. Thanks, Naomi, first for having me. And Anastasia, it's great to be here with you and everyone watching. Um, so yeah, I did. I was kind of one of the categories that Dr. Schulte was talking about who was diagnosed as a kid. In 2004, when I was 12 years old, I was in gym class rollerblading about to score a goal. And then I just fell, which, you know, was a little embarrassing, but um, I had a seizure ended up um, happening at that time. And then so I was brought to the hospital and they found a brain tumor and was diagnosed with a oligodendroglioma uh, that was located in the left motor sensory cortex. So the area of my brain that controls my right side movement and sensation and so at that time, um, you know, back in 2004, radiation wasn't really um, wanted unless you needed it. So I went for surgery and ended up it, losing a lot of movement in my right side, which fortunately I was able to gain back, but still don't have movement below my ankle. So I've since then worn a brace, which is always kind of like a physical reminder of, of what I'm going through, uh, but also had, you know, mental challenges and, you know, learning disabilities growing up and working through that. But I found myself very lucky, you know, I learned kind of what Anastasia was saying, you know, from a young age, you know, how valuable um, life is. And so I really, you know, went to college, you know, worked as EMT, pursued my passions for the environment, you know, in Madagascar and on the high seas and in, um, on a tall ship and then moved to Indonesia after college, uh, working my dream job in ocean conservation. Uh, but then a year and a half um, into that, I ended up having seizures, you know, about 10 years, 11 years since I was first diagnosed and um, went back home for the first time Thanksgiving break. And, you know, sitting there, I remember in the Jimmy Fun Clinic with you know, five year old, six years old, I'm 23 years old at that time. Um, and I was diagnosed again with a recurrence. Uh, this time, though, it was um, not operable. Um, and so it was kind of a shock because all my life was in Indonesia. Everything I knew and had built up was there. And then suddenly I couldn't return home. I moved in with my mom and um, her boyfriend at that time, now my stepfather. Um, and it, my like sense of identity um, was just left behind in another country, including all my clothes. <laughs> um, and it was, it was isolating. And I think, you know, I don't need to go into all the the challenges, because I think Dr. Schulte did a good job laying out what those most challenges are. And I think, you know, <laughs> every single circle I can relate with. Um, but it was really this point when I was 23, entering this no man's land between being a pediatric cancer survivor to them being a young adult and all these new experiences of what it's like to be a young adult with cancer and having to transition into that and the like, isolation uncertainty, not being able to relate to anyone. Um, you know, around me, all my friends were kept going while I was, you know, doing treatment for a year and a half. Um, and I really had to develop coping mechanisms, which I know we'll get into later. Um, but, you know, things like writing and advocacy that helped me out and really meeting other cancer survivors too. Um, and so eventually, you know, I went through treatment, um, but it was a new reality of, it wasn't about if I would get a recurrence, it was about when, which I think is a reality for a lot of brain tumor patients um, and what makes it unique from other cancers. And there's that kind of existential uncertainty that you have to learn to deal with. Um, and so I was fortunate enough, I went to move to California um, where most of you are at um, and started med school and a graduate school program. Uh, but just nine months into that, I had yet another recurrence, um, a lot sooner than what my doctors and I had expected. Um, and so I went again through an awake brain surgery for the parts they could, could remove, but, uh, for the rest of the parts that they couldn't remove, it actually had evolved into a more aggressive form of cancer. And at that point, given the life history of my tumor, um, and also the unique molecular characteristics of it, it wasn't, um, didn't fit any, into any standard of care. So actually since then. I've been doing experimental treatment and I continue to do experimental forms of treatment. Uh, but fortunately I've been stable, you know, since 2018, which has um, been a godsend. Um, yeah, it's a different form of dealing with cancer than I was when I was 23, because this time I'm almost the, the two circles that Dr. Schulte showed 
are now overlapped with each other, the act of treatment and survivorship. And so it's dealing with all the challenges of treatment, but also still all the emotional realities of survivorship. And, um, you know, also with the existential sense of mortality too. And so how I move forward, and I kind of want to form more to a discussion with Anastasia, so I'm going to cut off soon. But um, for me, it's really about by thinking about kind of the uncertainty and sense of mortality that these types of diagnoses bring, by thinking about that, it's really helped me learn what my values are of how I want to be living my life. And so, you know, I ended up moving back here to Boston to be close to my family, uh, which is one of my most important values. Um, you know, doing activities that really bring me into the present, like sailing, uh, being able to be an uncle to, you know, my three uh, newborn nephews. Um, and you know pursuing things like relationships and stuff like that but it, it's it can be challenging but it's also as what Anastasia was saying you really learn how precious life is um and I think that really even though you're a little isolated from you know friends and other young adults I think that's something that if you learn that from very young in life um or as a young adult it's a it's a silver lining to it all Great, thank you. Anastasia, was there anything that you wanted to comment on from what Jeremy said that kind of sparked your... You actually reminded me that I'm going through my recurrence right now too. No. Uh, so I am uh, on my second month of chemotherapy, gonna go get some blood work, uh, not tomorrow, but the day after, uh, and uh, confirm that I'm qualifying for um, my next round of chemotherapy. And it's, and it's kind of like you spoke to about, it's not if it will happen, it's when. And I think that's something that, distinct, as you said, distinguishes brain cancer from so many others. It is something that a lot of people struggle to understand. If it's saying like, at one point I was, I was very in the very fortunate position to tell folks that my MRIs showed no visible signs of cancer, but that doesn't mean I'm cancer free. And it's, um, and also like a disconnect of, a lot of folks will ask, how are you feeling? On the one hand, I'm feeling great. Things are going great. But on the other hand, I've learned consistently that how I'm feeling doesn't matter and is not reflected in my MRIs. And I think what folks are really asking as part of that question is, how are you doing cancer wise? And I don't know. I don't know. Um, so it just reminded me of that. But it also, you, you, I completely agree with Jeremy in the, in the sense of gratitude and the silver linings. And uh, I'm very grateful for the things that this experience continues to teach me. Thank you for sharing that. And um, yeah, and so you talked, you both talked a little bit about um, kind of what's going on internally for you and, and kind of on the outside, you know, you look great, you look fine. I'm wondering for those that maybe are, are listening that might be parents or um, friends of people who have, who are young and, and living with brain cancer, what do you need them to know or what would you like them to, to know and hear? I think it's it's interesting because you know there's a period where you're reliant on family and friends. There's also a period where you want this you know um, independence. And so for me, I actually when I was diagnosed, my first recurrence, I my immediate reaction was, oh gosh, I brought this like burden onto my family now. Um, and you know when I was diagnosed, I remember going, you know, we were at the parking lot. I was with my mom, and my gut reaction was, to "Say I'm sorry." You know, she obviously turned that down, um, and I wanted my family to, you know, continue on with their normal lives because, again, I didn't want to bring this weight back into my family from what I had experienced as a child. And as a result of that, I kind of closed off from everyone. Um, I kept to myself for about a month, but I could feel the toll that I was having because. I was closing myself off emotionally. And so emotionally, I wasn't doing well, which then would, you know, exacerbate my physical symptoms and fatigue. And then all of that would then exacerbate my emotional stuff. So it was just this endless cycle. It didn't really break until actually it was my stepfather, who again was my mom's boyfriend at the time, which <laughs> moved right back into them at that point. And I had just kind of been meeting him at that time. And he was the one that I actually pushed to say, like, you need to open up. Like, we were here to help you. Um, and that kind of started turning things. So it was like, oh, wow, I do need to like, you know, I need to be able to communicate this. And so there were things that they could help with. There are also some things they couldn't help with. So that's when I sought out support groups and a therapist as well. And so I'd say to, you know, parents, care partners, whoever it is that's supporting, you know, a loved one or someone that they care for um, with a brain tumor, any cancer in general, is... Want to follow the lead of the patient, 
but two, when you do recognize that, you know, that the person with cancer is struggling to, to kind of push and to be there, you know, and not kind of put all the, I also think like not putting all the onus onto the patient too sometimes. Um, and there, there's, it's a delicate process, it's a tug and pull, but I think communication is, is key. Thank you so much. Anastasia, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, snaps for communication and relate to a lot of what Jeremy said. I would also say, kind of taking a different angle, no one has the perfect playbook for sharing this news, for sharing the news of a recurrence, and no one has the perfect playbook for how to receive it. And that's okay. It's okay to not be perfect. And the, if, I, if there's one thing I would say of like a big what not to do, it's don't ask or expect someone with cancer to support you through their own cancer. Um, it's surprising how common that is. And, and that's not to say that you can't have problems of your own. If you don't have cancer, you can, and you can ask anyone, including myself, including Jeremy for help. You always can. It's just that specific challenge of asking a person with cancer to support you through their own cancer. Um, and I think if I, and maybe I'm being too sensitive here, but I think the other phrase I would avoid is tell me if I can do anything. That's another thing that I get a lot. And the thing is, both of us know that's not what you actually mean. You're not actually offering to do anything. And being grateful for nothing, masquerading as everything, can sometimes get exhausting, to be perfectly frank. So more than anything, I would just ask the person in your life also, just how can I best support you? And don't tell them if there's there's anything you can do because if you're not actually offering to do absolutely anything, there's plenty of things you probably won't and probably shouldn't do. Um, but you can't ask how you can help. Uh, so, and I just want to also echo again everything that Jeremy has said about open communication as being so important. Yeah, just to piggyback on the how you can help part, I think what, you know, because my, fam <laughs> my family has been, you know, going through this for, um, you know, 17 years now. And so it's trying to learn, not just in terms of my family, also communicating what they need for help to, to others in their community as well, which I think is important for um, them to do too, because they're going through, it's a very different experience, but it's an equally challenging one. Um, and so being specific, like if you're wanting to support, um, you know, your, your loved one with cancer, you know, asking like, oh, can I bring you food? So rather than, so it doesn't kind of, you're not adding on the toll to the person going through whether it's treatment or even after treatment, um, the, the toll of having to choose, you know, how they can help you, you can just offer a specific thing and then the person can say yes or no, or suggest something different. Um, and I think one just final thing for, you know, loved ones and care partners to know is that the work doesn't end after treatment's over, you know, that what, you know, Dr. Schulte was going into about survivorship. That's honestly like the real work of having a brain tumor. Um, the active treatment part, you have a lot of support during that time, you know, from medical resources and people who know what you're going through, but sometimes all that support kind of drops off the cliff once people are, see you're not on treatment anymore, because with most cancers, people are like, oh, you're done. But with brain tumors, you know, it, it keeps going. I love that. That's really helpful um, for loved ones. What can we do to support you? Just an open question like that. Um, and to recognize that they're also dealing with their own emotions too. And, um, but it's important for you going through, through cancer that it's not, you don't have to hold it all in. It's, you don't have to feel guilty about it. You, you know, you can let it out. So thank you. Those are really, really great, great tips and ideas. Um, and so you did kind of allude to with this a little bit, but I would love to hear kind of more explicitly for those listening, like what, what has been some really helpful ways that you have, have, coped with strategies or ideas or perspectives that, that have really helped you cope that, that might, you might recommend to other young adults that are maybe faced with this diagnosis right now? I think a big one that both of us are probably going to share, not to steal Jeremy's thunder, but writing, um, sharing my story, communicating with others, being open has been so helpful. Um, when folks understand, it, it makes a lot of things so much easier. Um, and I think just communicating and, uh, and again, sharing your writing can also, it just helping get your thoughts on paper can really help wrap your head around it, coping, uh, in terms of coping. The other thing I would share is don't Google, don't Google statistics. 
especially if you're a young adult coping with this, you are not a statistic. I mean, just Google the average age. That is probably not your age. It's, um, I, I'm so grateful to know you to be here nearly two years later, but if you would Google statistics for my condition or probably Jeremy's either, like you would not see the same, it's the same outcomes that we are experiencing. So I, don't worry about that too much. Talk to your doctors, of course. Um, but I think uh, as much as you can, don't look at that and don't, don't fixate on it. And I know that's easier said than done, but I, and I think everyone goes to that journey of like Googling it, freaking out and then coping with it. Um, but yeah, definitely writing, being open, um, don't keep it in. Definitely. Thank Enjoy you so much. much. That's great. How about you, Jeremy? Would you recommend? Yeah, definitely did it to that. I think, um, you know, my writing started more so as a means to um, basically just update people rather than me having to tell each person just as a means of being like publish. And now everyone that I know knows um, in terms of the updates that were going on with my treatment or afterwards. But then I did find that it was a good just um, tool for me to use to digest all my emotions that were going on. I almost everything would build up and I'd feel a need to just, you know, type things down, whether or not I was going to share them. But similar to what Anastasia was saying, um, you know, it was a really good emotional tool. But then I actually found that um, other people were relating to uh, what I was writing. I think, you know, I read uh, Anastasia's piece in L and I was like, yes, yes, yes. Like <laughs> she gets it. And like, me. So good. <laughs> um, but so, you know, finding that and then you find like connections to other people. So that's actually what led me to other connections too. And so uh, you don't have to, you know, publish your writing at all. It's almost, you can just keep it as a journal for yourself. And it's a really good tool just to reflect on uh, your emotion journey. And also to look back again, like um, what Dr. Schulte was saying of just like congratulating yourself of what you've gone through. Sometimes it's easy to forget the journey. And so having some form of documentation of that is nice. Uh, but I'd also say what helped me coping wise, well, two other things. One on a more public facing um, and Anastasia, you know, does this work as well uh, with advocacy. Um, and really, I've you know done a lot of work with National Brain Tumor Society. And when I had my first diagnosis in um, 2014, I started working with the Young Adult Program at Dana Farber. And through those, it's not only the feeling of giving back, and which helps make meaning of um, my diagnosis and the illness I go through. And I think that what you can do to make some meaning of it and feel like you're, you know, um, moving forward with it. And it's not the illness holding you back and the illness, not your identity. Um, I think that's important, but it's also just connecting with other patients too. You know, I've come to lots of brain term patients, non-brain term patients within the AYA space. And it's great just to be able to talk to someone who, you know, gets it and you don't need to explain things. Uh, so that's been helpful. And for me, the outdoors is just what brings me kind of into peace and into the present and whatever that is for, you know, whoever's watching this um, or going through a brain tumor um, diagnosis, finding what brings that kind of centers them. And so it was outdoors for me. There's a great program, First Descents, uh, for young adults to be able to kind of um, their motto is outliving it and so it brings you back into the outdoors and for me it was great because I kind of got very insular after my first recurrence and it reintroduced me to really being adventurous and um, lifted my spirits which I think the emotional side of all of this is just so important not to be understated um, because it affects you physically too. These are great. Oh go ahead Anastasia. I think if, it, if I could just add one thing about the advocacy lens one thing I've been thinking about with both, I just add my advocacy and political work before my diagnosis and after, I think especially you can feel like you're making a difference and you really feel like you do. And sometimes, as Jeremy said, you can feel powerless in this situation. You can feel like things are just happening to you and what did I do to deserve this? But with advocacy and with making a change um, and perhaps even with experimental treatments, like you can feel like you're doing something and you have you you have a voice and you have a difference to make in this world and you, you're not just a powerless tool that something is happening to that feels unfair and I think regaining some of that control even in a situation in what or other ways you're out of control um can really help you feel empowered as a person 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like, agree with all of that. And I think sometimes I'll have to remind myself to like, just be easy on myself too, you know, cause sometimes I'm just tired. I want to take a nap and I don't want to do, obviously I don't want to write, you know, um, I just want to nap on my couch. And a lot of times, especially, you know, at our age, we feel like we need to be doing, 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 um, but with, you know, what we're going through, that's not always possible. And so sometimes it can feel like, um, like you're, I don't know the words, that's part of <laughs> brain tumor symptoms, word recall. Uh, but it feels like, you know, you're not doing what's expected of you, but there is no expectation. You, you know, you gotta be easy on yourself and um, take it one step at a time. Definitely, definitely. The way I think about it is, if I'm doing my honest best, that's enough. And some days my honest best just sucks. But it, it's it's in, in comparison to other days, it's like what you got out of bed. Some days that feels really like a big accomplishment. Um, and it's just being honest with yourself. And you're if you're doing your best, that's your best. That's the best you can do. Can't you can't ask for more? And you, you if you're do, giving your honest best, you can't fail. I think that's fantastic. And it's yes, harkening back to what Dr. Shelty was saying about honesty, just really, you know, um, honest with your feelings, honest with what you can give. And I love the kind of balance of self-care with um, advocacy being part of the solution. Uh, so it's really inspiring. Thank you. I want to remind all of you that are listening, you can feel free to submit a question in the Q&A. We do have about uh, 15 minutes left for Q&A, but I have um, some additional questions, if that's okay. And we can, because I know there's some people out there that are um, wondering about, you know, they're in the dating field right now. And they're just wondering about disclosing, not disclosing, like kind of doing that whole dance of how much do I say, when do I talk, you know, do you guys have any thoughts and tips on, on that? Um, yes, <laughs> um, that is, it's a, it's an interesting topic and it's something, um, what I find it's, it's interesting for me because I identify as a gay man. And so I've had to go through the coming out process and all, all the time have to go through, you know, the kind of typical, um, coming out process as someone who identifies, um, within the LGBT community and telling someone you have cancer is the same exact feeling I've realized, you know? Um, of coming out that you have cancer and it's hard to navigate because there is no rule book or playbook on it. Um, and I'm currently in, you know, I'm fortunate that I'm um, stable uh, medically right now with my tumor. And so I feel in the position to want to be dating. And it's something that actually um, brings me joy and is one of my values too, of, um, wanting to be in a relationship. So I'm, I'm out there going on dates and it's, I like the study that Dr. Schulte showed because more often than enough, what, what prevented me from going on dates was the fear of rejection or that someone wouldn't want to be dating with someone with a brain tumor, let alone someone who's on active treatment. Um, but I have not really come across a situation where when I've told someone that's been a reason to not continue with dating. Um, and I do find that I have to walk someone through the disclosure process. So I kind of let out little bits here and there on the first day and maybe, you know, feel it out whether I want to tell someone on the first day or the second day, because it's not like I feel like they need to know, but my experience being a brain tumor patient has been so influential on who I am as a person, what I value that for them not to know that is to not fully understand why I do what I do and why I value what I value. Um, and in the end, I, the way I view it, which makes me just not nervous at all is I eventually want to be with someone who doesn't have any issue with me having a brain tumor or being on treatment or going through any of that or having gone through any of that. And so if someone has an issue, then I don't want to waste my time on that. And so I just move forward. Um, and if you have that mindset, it, it took a while for me to get there, but if you can get to that mindset. It makes it a lot easier. Right. I completely agree with Jeremy. And I think also just, yeah, I'm an open book too. Like this is pretty openly out there about me. I'm, I assume if you Google my name, it kind of comes up. And I think kind of just as Jeremy said, it's, it's not, I'm not going to spell out every like little treatment that I have. I'm like, I have blood work this day and this thing coming up this day, like on the first date. But, um, I think, yeah, just gradually sharing, um, and, and it, it makes sense. And I think it's, it's exactly as Jeremy said, it's, 
I want to be with someone who understands and who is willing to support me through that and might as well just rip the band-aid off if, you, if, you're, if you're not down it is what it is thank you guys so much for your honesty and candor with that topic i know it's, <laughs> it was a tough one but i appreciate what you handled it um and so how can you know you guys were talking about like really being kind of part of the solution really you know getting into advocacy how how can people get connected with with who you are and what you do and kind of join join your team so to speak oh totally i can start um uh, uh jeremy mentioned a couple of great organizations what i would say is cancer con is coming up early next month from stupid cancer which uh dr Schulte also mentioned going to be speaking there great convention I just, I love the, the ethos of it and I love the various conversations folks have. It really is a great opportunity to meet other folks who are kind of our age and experiencing the same thing. Because sometimes, you know, when you go to those neuro-oncology clinics and you see everyone who's, you know, multiple times your age, can be terrifying, can be very isolating. And it's just, it's great to connect with folks who have been through this and to remind yourself and to really see visually and to engage with others and to be reminded that you're not alone. Um, so I think there's so many different resources online. Uh, I'm sure Jeremy will speak to many as well, but um, so yeah, there's stupid, there's stupid cancer. Um, uh, Immerman Angels is another really great organization that matched me with uh, a long-term survivor of glioblastoma who I think has been around for two decades now. And knowing that's possible is so inspiring and she's fantastic and she's so fun and great to talk to. And it's just, it's great to talk to someone who gets it in a way that others might not. Thank you. Yeah, I think actually I want to go to cancer. Con. I've never been to cancer. Con, so maybe I'll book a trip in a month. Um, but I think it's really, you know, reaching to whatever Part of it that interests you or however it's whatever level you want to be involved in something um uh, just reaching out i think uh, you know for me you know before i really started advocacy stuff i just you know i went to a young adult uh cancer conference with dana farber and i met the keynote speaker and she recruited me to sit at the table that they do you know every every month um to to advertise their program and that for me was the first step to getting involved you know just sitting at the table being shy not really want to talk to people but just being a presence and feeling like i'm doing something and now you know i'm doing you know larger things uh dr schulte mentioned the the twitter chat brain tumor social media and so i help co-moderate um that with other uh brain tumor patients who, and hopefully I'll recruit Anastasia to do that too with their social media skills. Uh, but, and so we're, it's, there's always, we're, it's always different organizations always looking for people who want to get involved to get involved. So if you do have an interest to get involved in things, reaching out, um, you know, you can direct message me on Twitter or, or email me. Um, and with National Brain Tumor Society, for example, there's, different ways from just participating in a fundraiser to if you're interested in policy, going to lobby at the Capitol. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many organizations, I know we'll share the links, but um, really whatever level you're comfortable at getting involved. Um, and you can always build from there too. You don't have to just jump into the deep end as well. Um, and again, as Anastasia was saying, it's just a great way to meet people who get it. Um, yeah. I think also I get this question a lot in politics in general too, and folks are like, what's the perfect way for me to get involved? What is the perfect way for me to learn politics? And I think just learning about cancer is very similar. Just just do it. Very, very Nike slogan, but just do it. There is no perfect way, but you'll you'll learn as you go. Um, you'll discover organizations you like and what organizations you whose activities you might might not interest you as much. Um, and I think just go for it. And um, same idea here. Uh, direct message me, email me. I'm extremely online uh, and truly happy, always happy to chat. Fantastic. Thank you. And those of you watching can see that the, the chat box is getting really, really full. Um, I don't want you to worry about having to like copy that all down. This is going to be in a follow up email. You'll get all those links. I'll make sure to, to have it in there. Um, and also, Dr. Schulte, I wondered. I know you mentioned this in your presentation about clinical trials. Um, and can you walk us through that again? Like, it, how would somebody know if there might be a clinical trial that they would be appropriate for? How, how would they find that? Yeah, so as a general primer for clinical trials, it can differ quite a bit, <clears throat> excuse me, by the institution. So 
you know, for example, Stanford's down the road here, they're great neuro-oncology program, and we have different, completely different trials. And it doesn't mean necessarily that one trial is more promising or better than the other. Sometimes it just happens that way, and it's the connections that um, we have with pharmaceutical companies or with scientists or whatever. Um, so that's one thing to note that different institutions um, have different trials. You know, even if you're in the adult clinic, you might have different trials at a different institution. And you really have to call and see, one, what you're eligible, which is um, takes a lot of time for the physician to go through your whole case and make sure that you meet the criteria and that it's safe for you um, and that sort of thing. And two, if they have open spots. So um, there is there are some websites online where you can sort of get a sense of that. So clinicaltrials.gov has all of, all of the clinical trials that have been open recently. It's a little outdated, but you can get a sense of things. And then Mary, I think if you could post the, the UCSF one to look at the UCSF trials where you can search by age, that's a little bit more in date and you can get a sense of things. And then for the pediatric versus adult. So fortunately, a lot of clinical trials are more designed now to molecular targets rather than age groups. Classically, it was 18 and above, 18 and below. Um, but we, we know is that the pathology can overlap that age range and it's more about what genetic alterations the tumor has, what molecules are altered, what signaling pathways are altered. So some trials are becoming more inclusive and especially on the pediatric side, some trials can go up to even age 39. So um, it's not, it's a lot to navigate as the patient, but you can say to your doctor, hey, are there any other good places I should be looking at to think about trials? Do you know of anything for my age on the pediatric side? And then they can help you navigate those opportunities. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and I think we have time maybe for one more question uh, and then we will open it up to anybody who wants to stay afterwards and we'll continue talking. So, you mentioned Dr. Schulte, and I think uh, you alluded to it too, Jeremy, um, about being with your parents and, and living with your parents and um, kind of the, the push-pull with the independence, like being independent, but also the needing your family. Um, and so anything that makes that easier, um, the kind of seeing your friends kind of moving on in their lives and then needing to kind of be, be at home again, um, what might make that easier for people? Any thoughts? Yeah, a few thoughts. Um, I think the first the first part that makes it easier is setting for me what I've done with my family is also in terms of establishing independence from my own medical experience and journey is um, setting guidelines. So, for example, for every doctor appointment, we have clear rules essentially of you know I I do the talking I you know I ask all my questions first. But then once I'm done, then, you know, my mom can ask her questions, things like that, you know, to really make sure that it's the doctor patient relationship is me and my physician. So there's independence on that side in terms of the isolation and um, wanting to have independence as a young adult, especially if you're having to live at home. Um, I, I feel like there's a little bit of onus on, for example, I put, I you know, blocked off myself from my friends for, for a little bit, especially when I was younger, when I was a, a kid. And it was one of my biggest regrets, actually, uh, from when I was first diagnosed with cancer. And so I actively, um, when I had my recurrence, especially my second recurrence, I knew what I needed to do was really to actively reach out because people want to be there um, with you, uh, but they don't know exactly what to do or how to do it. And they're kind of tipping their toes around. Um, so there is a little bit of onus. And I to, to have to reach out. But once you do that, you'll be really surprised and glad of how many people in your life want to be there with you. Um, and that, especially during my second recurrence, as I said, was, was really helpful and really helped me maintain kind of that social and peer support uh, within the circles I had before and also you no know, new circles that I created or people who I haven't talked to for a while who reached out and um, I got to see again. Yeah, I completely agree with what Jeremy has said. And also just 
having folks like give you a ride to appointments or coming with you to appointments. Um, I had very folks accompany me to radiation and it was kind of fun. It, I mean, it made it suck less, but it was also, it was just really lovely to see folks and kind of, as Jeremy said, also folks will surprise you and just kind, kind of come out of nowhere. And it's really lovely to have those reconnections. And in some ways you can really have an opportunity to make the most of it. And I'm so grateful for even those rides and getting to chat with various folks and for all of their support. Um, just so, so much to be so grateful for. Thank you so much. Well, I am so grateful for all of you. Um, Anastasia, Jeremy, Dr. Schulte, thank you so much for being here. For those of you who need to leave us, I wanna thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again at a future event. For those of you who would like to stay and I will shut off the recording now, we will let you know how to hang out with us. We'll be promoting you to panelists. We'll be removing your last name. And um, thank you again so much to uh, all of you for your great information for being here.